We've begun the pre-Lenten season here today. This is the third Sunday before Lent, uh, also called Septuagesima. This morning in the upcoming sermon, I'm going to expound on two great lessons from Scripture, which have similar messages. St. Paul's exhortation, on the one hand, to run in this life and to view it as a race, and one that we must run well with endurance. And then Jesus' parable of the laborers in the vineyard. Uh, this too has elements of a kind of, a, of exhortation to endurance, but li like a race, but with greater points to make. Uh, we're called into a vineyard to work by God. We are given the privilege to labor in his vineyard, and he supplies the strength to labor on. And he gives generously to those of us who labor, whether it's for a short time in this life or when we, that we enter the work, or wh whether we've labored for a long time and from an early age if we've begun our Christian walk early on in life. Or as some church fathers see it, uh, those who labored uh, before us in time, um, the great patriarchs and prophets and people of God in the Old Testament, and then we being New Testament arrivals. Uh, all have received an equal reward for entering into the ma of entering into the Master's kingdom. The message of, is in both is the gift of God, that he has called us to run and to labor, also that we may obtain the prize of eternal life, which is bestowed upon us by Christ himself, on the last day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Though our colic today, our prayer uh, for this Sunday, really doesn't reflect it, um, our scripture readings today really give us a clear, uh, unified uh, set of instructions, gives us direction, and it really gives us encouragement. Uh, St. Paul's lesson from his letter to the Corinthians uh, is encouragement for perseverance, perseverance in running that race that he speaks of. Matthew's recording of Jesus' parable is also somewhat um, about perseverance and endurance, but it's also about receiving a reward, <clears throat> which the Lord will give to each one on the last day. Yet, as we can see in this parable this morning, not all labored uh, for the same amount of time, not all labored in equal ways, in other words, as it is today with our own Lives, lives as Christians. But all, Paul says, all run the race, only one receives the prize. So he encourages us run so to obtain it. Or in the case of our parable, all who are called to labor also will receive something. And finally, in Jesus' parable, there is this resentment factor, which we'll get to as well. Some who labored all day are not happy that they are receiving the same wage as those who labored only a little while. Or to put it another way, those who were hired late enjoyed the same reward as those who were hired early on. But both in, in both of our lessons today should help us to begin help us to uh, to begin uh, this this pre Lenten season. Uh, Lent is that time where we enter into spiritual practices, practices that deepen our spiritual and our physical commitment, uh, deepen our efforts uh, at, at endurance. And, and, and running the race that is set before us, running and laboring on in this life. We take on things or we give up things in Lent that are important to us, or, or maybe even too important, too important to us, and we set them aside for a time. Maybe we even set them aside permanently as Lent comes to a close, we can leave those behind if they do hinder us in running and laboring. If we, we, we take stock, uh, we, we will take stock of our lives during Lent, and we see in what ways we can continue to press on to, in serving the Lord with less or with adjustments made to our lives of, of comfort. Uh, and, th in, and this in turn teaches us the importance of leaning only on God, leaning only on God's grace and nothing else, certainly not on our own selves. Lent and even the preparatory season uh, before it, remind us that this life, it is to be, if it is to be one of endurance and running and laboring, uh, must be done with as few hindrances as possible. Self-imposed hindrances are really what we have in mind many times. Um, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like, interestingly, J Jesus says today. Notice that this is a parable that reflects the life that we live here and now, and yet it's kingdom of heaven living. A kingdom of heaven living is running and laboring here in this life, looking for the finish line and looking for labor in the next life. 
As we know from, from other places where Jesus speaks, uh, we read things like this. In, in Luke chapter 17, uh, being asked by the Pharisees uh, when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus answers and he says this. He says, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Uh, nor will anyone say, look, there it is over there, or, or here it is over here. Behold, he says, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. It's in the midst of you. So the presence of the kingdom is in some mysterious way here and now in the midst of us still. And yet imperceivable, at least in the ways that we usually perceive and see things. The kingdom of God is both a partly present thing right now and is partly a future thing. For the Pharisees and the Jews of the time, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God coming or the kingdom of God arriving would mean uh, Romans, of course, would be removed probably first on the list, Israel would be established again as an earthly kingdom, at, and that, that would be set up. And then, But Jesus corrects them of this, and he says it doesn't come like that. It doesn't look like that. And we know Jesus certainly didn't overpower the Romans uh, and, and remove them. Uh, he, the, the Jews who followed him certainly didn't, didn't regain power at the hand of Jesus either. He taught rather... He taught his followers how they were to live under that rule and despite that presence, despite the occupying forces of Romans, despite the difficult lives that they had to live, persecution, ridicule for their faith, being thrown out of the synagogue. And living under these circumstances, would he be even more blessed than living a life of ease or of one where they would return to its, their temple sacrifices and those would supposedly go on forever. Second, at Jesus' arrival uh, during his ministry, he cast out demons. We know that he does that a number of times. And we read this in Matthew chapter 12. Jesus says, if, the, if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So as Jesus is found in, in that case, casting out demons, he says, this is an indicator that the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is present. I have brought it, in other words. And as the Spirit of Christ continues to do the work today, in our day, of casting out sin and giving life to dead sinners and, and frustrating demonic powers and influences are over us, and people continuing, of course, also to convert to the Christian faith, we can say that the kingdom remains present in our present day as well. The Holy Spirit brings Christ's conquering power still today. So the kingdom is still present. The kingdom is still present in a certain way. Uh, and, and that really is the reason for our confidence in the race that we have to run today and the laboring that we have to partake of in this life right now as well. The kingdom of God remains present as God works through his people. We as uh, ambassadors of Christ are now at work laboring in God's vineyard teaching through, through teaching, preaching, helping and healing others, giving and loving, serving one another, carrying out that second, second table of the law, growing in the spirit of holiness. So, this, so these things should, should lift some of the weight of the burden that we carry when we think about the life that we live in now, uh, the difficulties, the, the corruption, the lies that are told to us the stifling and confining restrictions that are, that are put upon us by others. This should cause us to see the race that is set before us or the race that we run in now and the, as one that has a finish line, and that finish line is in view. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house. We'll dip, dip into this, delve into this parable here. The kingdom of heaven, he says, is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. So God as the master, we could say maybe even Christ as the master, he goes out early in the morning to seek out to hire laborers for his vineyard. Notice too that he's portrayed here as he's going out and finding them, finding laborers. They're not searching for work per se. He hires them for a certain amount. Each person, as each person is brought into the vineyard, brought into the Christian faith, he's then called unto labor. And, and, and we know as we know from our, from our own baptismal rite, and the formula is in there, uh, we read, no one can enter into the kingdom of God except to be born anew of water and of the Holy Spirit. 
So when we're baptized, even as infants, we are entering into the kingdom of God and we're entering into the vineyard of God. And we can see the progression, really, as we, as we kind of go along through, throughout the baptismal service, the baptismal rite. Once a child or the adult is baptized into the faith, he is received into Christ's holy church. In, in other words, received into the vineyard and he's made a living member of it. But God, again, God is doing the work here. God is the one who calls us into the vineyard. He's the one who fits us for laboring there and, and, and making us a living mem- by, by, ma- by making us a living member of it. We're no longer idly sitting by, dead in our trespasses and sins, but we are rather alive and we are hired and fit for the work. We thank God later on in that same baptismal rite that God has vouchsafed to call us to the knowledge and faith in him. He calls us. He brings us in. He equips us for the labor. And then there's a renouncing of all that would hinder our laboring in in the vineyard. Uh, The devil and all of his works. The vain pomp and uh, glory of this world. uh, And the covetous desires of the flesh. All so that we would not follow nor be led by them. All so that we would not be distracted from the labors at hand. Also, that we would not be lazy or, or slothful or, uh, in the work of the vineyard either. And then Jesus says in the parable that the master went out about the third hour. And he saw others standing idle there. He hires them. Likewise, he does so again at various times of the day, still finding more uh, to call into his vineyard to do the work. He even finds laborers to call in at the proverbial 11th hour, the very last hour of the day, the very last possible hour of the day to work. And they too are brought in to labor. Uh, some of the church fathers like, liken these various labors uh, um, called in, in various times to certain um, Old Testament figures. Cyril of Alexandria does it. There's another one in the volume who is an unnamed church father. Unfortunately, we don't know who wrote that. But Cyril, he says this. He says, around the first hour are those at the time of Adam and Enoch. At the third hour, are those in the time of Noah and Shem and the righteous descending from them. So assume here he's assuming that he means that once Noah's flood has subsided, there's a, there's a second chance and kind of a new beginning. He goes on, the workers called at the sixth hour are those in the time of Abraham, the time of the institution of the circumcision. Those at the 11th hour are those just before Christ's advent. So, and, and another, the other father, the anonymous one, he, he, says, he says something similar. Uh, he went out early, he says, quote, he went out early and he summoned Adam and those who were with him. At the third hour, Noah and those who were with him. At the sixth hour, Abraham and those who were with him. At the ninth hour, Moses and those who were with him. Or he adds David and those who were with him. For to these he gave the testaments. At the eleventh hour, we understand the Gentiles. Because now we stand on the very edge of the world. As John testifies in his letter, saying, children, it is the last hour. According to the apostle, I'm still quoting here, according, according to the apostle, some part of the 12th hour has now passed, for he says, salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. That was the 11th hour. Now in our time, the 12th hour is not yet complete, but without a doubt, he says, little time remains, we are in the 12th hour. Unquote. So, it seems like a fair construct. Uh, it's the order of God's unfolding plan, certainly, of, of calling laborers into his vineyard, different periods of history, certain major figures along the way. But when we get to the end, we find this exchange uh, between the master and those who labor the longest. They thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. The same pay as those who labored less. The same reward for laboring goes to everyone. So they grumble at the master of the house, the master of the vineyard. These last worked only one hour, they say, and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the heat and the scorching, sorry, the burden of the day and the scorching heat. The master corrects them on this error in being upset and discontent. He says, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Um, Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? 
Do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first last. That interesting line there at the end too. Those who are hired first as the day progresses become the last, don't they, in the line. And those who are hired last become first. But all are treated equally, notice. All are treated equally when it comes to the payment or the reward. All receive the denarius. All receive the day's wage because all have labored, all get paid. Some through the heat of the day, some only at the end of the day. And yet all are treated with what is promised to them. Gregory the Great has a quote on this. He says, we who come at the 11th hour do not murmur after our labor and we receive a denarius. After our mediators coming into the world, we are led into the kingdom as soon as we leave the body. We obtain with no delay what our ancestors obtained only after waiting a long time, unquote. So we enter into rest, he says, immediately along with those who came long before us and who labored long before us. Sometimes the life we live, uh, even as Christians, seems long and hard. Should we not hear, think of it this way. Should we not hear as laborers who have worked in the kingdom for a long time rather be grateful to have been called at all? Or to see it as an opportunity and a privilege of laboring for such a generous and gracious master as our God. He called us. We did not push our way into his vineyard. He brought us here to do the work. He could have justly and rightly have passed us over, left us in the marketplace idle to suffer hunger and eventually perish forever, but he did not. He sought us out to labor. So we can briefly shift over here uh, in our last few minutes to St. Paul today and see that the Christian life, very similar in Paul's description, the Christian life is one of endurance, running a race, striving for a prize, and doing so with assurance. Our assurance is that we have been called into the race by Christ's regenerating power. Recall that baptism again as we've been called into the vineyard by that same power. Christ has made us his own. He has bought us with the cost of his own blood. He has begun a good work in us, and he will see it to completion. So whatever stage of the race we are in right now, whatever part of the vineyard that we've been called to labor in right now, be it a difficult and stony ground and hard labor or or an uphill climb as, as we think about the race, we have the grace of God to help and support us all along the way. Let us never be discouraged. We should never be discouraged in this life. Our Lord Jesus Christ is a good and he's a generous master who desires not the death of a sinner. He has called us to labor in this life, not blindly, but with promises and hope to look for. He assists us with his grace. And in the sacrament of the Eucharist, which we will partake of very soon, he supplied the nourishment for the race and the strength for the labor with the promise that he will bring us across the finish line of that race and he will give us our reward at the end of the day. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, amen.